In a world of Democrats, there will be time for them to make profits. Now's not that time. And Republicans have abandoned free market principles to save the free market system. You need a voice of liberty. Look no further. You found it. Tom Woods. Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Monday, September 22nd, 2014. And today we're talking about the Taylor Rule. Some of you may know about the Taylor Rule, but I bet a bunch of you don't. But whether you do or you don't, you're going to find this conversation educational and useful. Without stealing the thunder of my guest, I'll just tell you that the Taylor Rule was introduced some time ago by a professor. We'll get all the details in a second. The idea of it is that this is the proper guide for monetary policy. This is a guide for what the Federal Reserve should do when making monetary policy. It should go by this guide. This equation is a guide telling it what to do in terms of interest rates. And the claim is that if only the Fed had followed the Taylor rule, we wouldn't have had the housing boom and subsequent bust. And there are a lot of free market economists out there, at least mildly free market, who are big fans of the Taylor rule. They say, this is what we need more of. It's a good rule for the Fed to follow. Well, I bet you're already smelling a rat here. And if so, it means you are a loyal listener of this show. Let me turn it over now to our guest. Our guest today is Mateusz Mahai. Matt is a professor of economics at the University of Wrocław in Poland. That's W-R-O-C-L-A-W, by the way. He is widely published on various economic topics. In my opinion, he's one of the strongest young Austrians we have anywhere in the world, and he joins us today from Poland. Matt, welcome to the show. Hello, Tom. Good to see you. Good to hear you, actually. Well, I'll tell you, I have been looking forward to this paper of yours on the Taylor Rule for some time because the Taylor Rule has been cited for so long by so many people who describe themselves as free market economists that it has become more or less the conventional wisdom that the Taylor Rule is a good guide for the central bank in formulating monetary policy. Now, that very sentence is problematic from an Austrian point of view, but I want all the same to look at the specifics of the Taylor Rule with you. I just read your paper over lunch yesterday, and today in the show notes, we will make sure and link people to the short version that is up at Mises.org. Let's start off by explaining who Taylor is and what the Taylor Rule says in a way that's that's understandable to the layman. Ah, well, that, uh, John Taylor started working on monetary policy uh, in the early 90s, and he published a paper describing what apparently the Federal Reserve System uh, was doing in terms of monetary policy in the 80s. And he uh, apparently discovered that uh, uh, the Federal Reserve was following some version of the monetary, monetary policy rule, a sort of fixed rule. Uh, it was not totally fixed like the, the famous Friedman rule. It was a little bit elastic, but still it was a general rule for the monetary policy. And it was a purely descriptive paper. And then after a few years, suddenly, from this purely descriptive paper, which, by the way, can of course be discussed, uh, suddenly in the literature we have flourishing of the concept, the Taylor Rule, based on this paper, as if it was some normative uh, proposition how to conduct a correct monetary policy, whereas it was just a description of what was uh, done in the 80s. Uh, and that's how we got uh, into the whole Taylor Rule thing, and um, also in uh, in the early uh, 21st century uh various versions of the of the Taylor rule were proposed for the monetary policy uh, unfortunately they failed uh, but Taylor himself in 2009 uh after this after the great recession uh, started he uh, published a paper arguing that the federal reserve system was not following his rule and that was the reason for the real estate boom, and that was the reason for the Great Recession, the main uh, the main factor for the recession, of course. And therefore, from this uh, from his description, 
uh, various, uh, let's say, mildly pro-market people uh, with a sort of Friedmanite sentiment for uh, for having government rules that are supposed to constrain the government. From that, we have the sentiment somehow uh, about following the Taylor rule that is constraining government in some way by uh, by proposing a form of monetary constitution or something like that in order to stabilize the economy. But, of course, the main problem is that uh, this rule itself is, is vague, it's, it's, it's unclear, and it actually opens the door for, uh, for a disruptive uh, monetary policy because it's still a monetary policy performed by the government, by a government agency. Right. So that, of course, is going to be the ultimate problem with it. But right. what you, one of the points you're making in the paper is even if we accept the idea that the Taylor rule is a good policy, even if we accept the idea that we should have some rule that overrides what would spontaneously occur on the market. Nevertheless, there are practical problems even with implementing the Taylor rule, one of them being the problem of figuring out which data ought to be used because it depend, exactly. because depending on which numbers you use, you wind up getting a different Taylor rule. Before we get into that, though, what exactly is is the Taylor rule saying the central bank should do? Because he's saying that if you had listened to my Taylor rule, interest rates would have been higher and you wouldn't have had right. this housing bubble. So what, is, what does the rule tell the central bank it should do with interest rates? Okay, the, the, the Taylor rule itself is just an equation. Uh, and the equation can have many different forms. Uh, it, to make it as simple as possible to our listeners, uh, the equation says that you're supposed to arrive at certain level of the interest rate set by the central bank based on two other main variables, that is price inflation and the so-called output gap. Uh, apart from that, we have some additional coefficients that we put in the equation, and we arrive at the final number. Uh, the higher the inflation rate, of course, the higher uh, the recommended interest rate by the central bank, and uh, the bigger output gap, that is, uh, the, the farther away we are from, uh, let's say, potential production, potential output, uh, then the interest rates are supposed to be lower in order to uh, boost spending and boost the economy and, and reach potential levels. Now, there are two main problems with, with this approach, and one, uh, one uh, group I would name as actually mainstream objections to the rule itself, and the other group I would just name Austrian, uh, Austrian objections. Well, the, 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 the mainstream objection would be that you have various problems with measurements, as you mentioned, that is how, do, how you measure price inflation uh, and how you measure the so-called output gap. And there is a lot of uh, there are lots of articles written in in the mainstream literature actually arguing that there are serious problems with measuring the so-called potential output, the the potential production. Uh, some mainstream economists actually argue that we should get rid of it and forget about this because various ways of uh, of measuring this this whole uh, potential output are actually so vague that we should downplay it completely and forget about this. Well, actually, let me, uh, let me jump in on this issue of, of the output gap, because this is a term that I would think most normal people are not familiar with. Uh, the output gap is something that you, you'll hear a lot of, uh, especially Keynesian economists, talk about when there's a recession. They say that there's an urgent need for stimulus programs because every day that we don't engage in stimulus, we are losing potential output. Our factories are idle. Our workers are idle. We have this potential to produce all these goods because, look, we have the raw materials, we have the factories, we have the people, but none of these things are coming together, and stimulus can bring them together. And so we, so in other words, every day that they don't come together, we lose potential output and because right. we could potentially be producing at this level up here, but because of the recession conditions and the unemployment of resources, we're producing only down here. So there's an output gap between where we would be producing if everything were gainfully employed, as opposed to what we're producing now when some things are not gainfully employed. That's what's meant by the output gap. Am I right about that? Yep, yep. Well, on the very, very general level, uh, the, the, the name itself, the term itself, potential output, makes some sense, of course, because every economist would tell you that uh, when we are in a recession, 
we, our uh, production possibilities are not fully utilized, they are not fully used because we have high unemployment, we have various scarce and idle factors of production that we could employ to increase our production. So on the very, very general level, this is purely correct. But the question is, uh, how do we solve this problem, right? So how do we make sure that all those various sectors are employed, in fact, and uh, various stimulus programs, government programs that are being used, often result in some form of uh, employment of those factors, but this, this employment is at the expense of more investment created by that government spending or by that government stimulus, that is by capital consumption. So uh, there's the famous paper by Austrian economist Fritz Maklub about capital consumption in Austria, where he describes how various government policies, well, they, they resulted in some uh, stimulus for economic activity, but the final result after, after many years was that there was huge capital consumption and decrease in general level of wealth in the country. So uh, the question is, of course, we are in the re when we are in the recession, uh, real production is below some uh, below some uh, level of potential production. This is true. When we have high unemployment, of, uh, of course, we could reach higher employment levels. But the question is, how do we get there, and how do we make sure that? An increase in employment and an increase in uh, in the usage of idle factors of production results in permanent growth, higher growth, and sustainable growth. That's the key question. Right, exactly. Uh, it, it seems right. to me that the idea of the output gap takes for granted that the current configuration of uh, mm -hmm. the, the of the structure of production is optimal, and all we need to do right. is just rev it up Plus again start spending. it up again yeah but what if what if in fact the employment of res the deployment of resources is incorrect in in, in some right. sense then then it's a problem there is in other words they're thinking as you say later in the paper they're thinking in terms of volumes instead of thinking in terms of patterns of, of capital. exactly and that's the basic keynesian message that's the essence of keynesian economics uh, as somewhere Keynes wrote in, in general uh, theory, I believe, he said, I am not concerned with the direction of employment. I am concerned about the volume of employment. So that's why you have all those arguments about pe people digging the holes and then and then uh, filling in, filling them up again with, uh, uh, with with whatever trash or putting uh, printed dollars in bottles and then putting bottles down uh, between the surface and then digging them up again. So all those arguments are based. Uh, all, all various Keynesians are, Keynesian arguments actually are based on this notion that we are focused on the volume, not the direction. Right? And then classical economics and, and especially Austrian economics is focused more on the direction of employment. So that is how we employ resources in, in various stages of production and in various places in the economy. So this is what matters for efficiency in the long run. Um, it's always easy to just spend the money on whatever and hire people. Uh, but uh, the big question is, can we go on with this for a longer time, not just for like a couple of months or, or two years? So what is the role then that this idea of the output gap plays in Taylor? Is he saying that we have to look at the output gap, which is di a difficult concept to begin with and certainly a difficult one to measure? Is he saying we have to look at that and have that be one of the factors that decides where the central bank should should target interest rates. Right. So uh, there are various ways of, uh, of, of measuring the output gap, and actually those ways are, uh, there is no reason to assume that one way is better than the other. And they actually can, uh, each of those ways can, can give us totally different results. And, 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 and then if they give us totally different results, we will have different recommendations for the interest rate. So uh, using one concept of the output gap might result in the interest rates of, let's say, 5%. And using the other concept of, of potential output uh, and, and the output gap, we will have interest rates recommendations at, for example, 2.5%. So that's a big difference between 5 and 2.5, and 2 right? That's a huge difference. But in any case, uh, whatever type of uh, way we are using, uh, originally Taylor was using a very, very, um, very uh, comfortable, let's say, uh, concept. He was just focused. He was focused on the trend. 
So he basically said, now we just look at the long-term trend, and long-term trend is showing us potential output, and we just focus on that, right? So this is one of the, one of the, potential, one of the possible ways to do this. Uh, but w w whatever type of way you use, whether it's the general trend or whether it's based on some form of econometric models, uh, or on some other ways, whatever type of, of uh, measuring you're using, you arrive at certain aggregate level of something, uh, of uh, potential output. That is, that is to say we, for example, reach an observation that uh, potential output is 3% higher than total production. The basic uh, methodological problem of this is that it's, it's, it's totally aggregated and averaged out number, right? So it's not telling you anything at all about the direction of employment. It's not telling you anything at all about small investments. It just tells you that some number that we have uh, gathered from the current data, that is gross domestic product, and some totally invented variable that we call potential output is different by 3%. So it doesn't tell you anything at all about the extent of more investments and problems with direction of employment of factors of production. That is to say, it, it connects in no way uh, the interest rate with what is really going on in the economy. And that's, that's the, the fundamental macroeconomic problem that I see in this role. Getting back to the practical issues of the different ways you can measure these sorts of things, output gap or inflation, so that you could wind up with different Taylor rules depending on which data you use, you would get a different right. outcome and a different policy prescription. I found it interesting in your paper, I can't help mentioning this, that uh, an economist at the Atlanta Fed, a David Altig, apparently yep. came up with a Taylor rule, a version of the Taylor rule using his version of the data that showed that the Fed did observe the Taylor rule during the housing yes. bubble years. So how exactly. useful can this thing be if it can be used both to condemn and praise the Fed? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's, the, that's the thing. In my paper, I have Taylor's presentation where he shows that uh, the Fed should have followed uh, his version of the rule, therefore interest rates would be higher, so there would be no real estate boom. I also give the example of Altic from the Federal Reserve. Of course, he presented it during the boom years, and he showed we are following uh, the Taylor rule and it's working. Uh, of course, he used the different sorts of data. And then I give to the third invented my version of the rule. Well, I show that actually we can have Taylor rule recommendations with even lower interest rates than the one that were set by Alan Greenspan. So we will have even more higher real estate boom than, than it actually uh, was the case. So... Uh, all those, all those things are about the ambiguity of the data are present in, in the mainstream literature. Also, there is this notion that, uh, that we can mention that uh, when we collect the data, that's always a challenge because the central bank, when it uses the data, it uses past data, but data is being constantly revised. For example, data about gross domestic products it can be revised and the revisions are substantial. So uh, it may turn out that when we currently, um, uh, and this is, this is the contribution of Orphanides, or I'm not sure I pronounce this correctly, um, uh, who, who is famous in the literature for criticizing actually the table, that, that he actually we can only focus on past data, but this data can be revised within months. But we have to make a decision right now. So should we somehow deal with revised data after that, or should we, focus, should, we, should we be more focused on predicted data? Because, of course, we're interested not in past inflation rates. We are interested in future inflation rates. That is, we're interested in what will happen in the future. So this complicates the issue even more, and this is all well present in the, in the mainstream literature. Uh, so this is, we're, we're still talking about this first group of arguments, right, that, uh, that, that we have all those measurement problems uh, about those variables that make the whole uh, idea of, of the Taylor rule very, very difficult to, to be applied for a successful monetary policy. So in a similar, it, it is kind of, um, it's a kind of similar to, to problems with the so-called Friedman rule, right? You remember the, the famous Friedman rule, which is dead by now, about the, the money supply growth each year. 
Then it turned out that we have some problems because we're not sure how to measure the money supply. We have various ways of measuring that can be changed and so on. The Taylor rule is even more difficult because it's not only the question of one variable called money supply. It's, it's a question of invented variable such as potential output. It's the question of uh, measured variables such as uh, real production, which is being constantly revised. And it's the problem, of course, of price inflation. We have various indices for price inflation also, right? Uh, they can differ. We have core inflation. We have personal consumption expenditures index. We have various ways of measuring price inflation. So which one do we choose for the equation uh, to arrive at successful interest rates? That's, that's the challenge, and that's the challenge even from the mainstream perspective. That's uh, one of the things um, in my paper that I try to be focused on, that is on mainstream objections to the rule itself, because apart from that, we have strong Austrian obje objections to the rule. Right, right, of course. I mean, the, the whole output, number one, the output gap concept itself, and secondly, the very idea of monetary policy. Of course, if, if we want to right. get into a really sweeping critique, we would start there. When you and I shared an office for a week this summer at the Mises Institute, I, I showed you an article that David Stockman had written on the Taylor Rule. David Stockman, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget under Ronald Reagan. And I just want to share with people the paragraph that I pointed out to you in particular. He, <laughs> he, he cites this lengthy passage from, from Taylor, and he says, <laughs> he says, only an academic power seeker could come up with a Rube Goldberg contraption that ludicrous. Just reread the policy rule in the second paragraph above. The four-quarter rate of inflation when there are 27 different versions published by the government statistical mills, all of which have been manipulated and deformed over the years. One half the deviation of national GDP from, quote, potential GDP, which is unmeasurable in a dynamic global economy, and a magic constant named two. At least he has the good grace to name this gibberish after himself. <laughs> you can't write that in an academic paper, unfortunately. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Uh, there's also one thing that we have to remember. Even putting aside uh, the arguments about uh, ambiguity of the data and, and uncertainty about the measurements, uh, there is a Hayekian element uh, if, uh, that we have to remember when we criticize the Taylor rule, because even if you assume that we have some sort of version of the rule where we have output gap measured and we have price inflation, and there we go, we have policy recommendation for the interest rate. The thing is that we are, by using, those, uh, by using that level of the interest rate, we are only targeting those two variables. That is, we are targeting certain level of inflation rate and certain level of the so supposed output gap. But uh, we just satisfy our macroeconomic goals that we have in our minds and in our government papers. What we are missing is that by pursuing this type of policy, we can still have small investment booms and financial bubbles. And that's the thing. Because even when you look at Taylor's paper from 2009, when he, where, where he demonstrates uh, with, uh, that, that interest rates should have been higher, he gives no uh, explanation how, uh, how this uh, equation, the Taylor equation, how it's supposed to relate to macroeconomic stability. He just assumes it. He just says, now look, interest rates could have been higher, and if they were higher, of course, there was no more investment boom. Well, that's fine, but it's not really a theoretical argument. Uh, whereas Hayek gave us a uh, very, very nice, uh, and that's, I think that's the basic, uh, the, the, the fundamental and the most important contribution uh, by Hayek in terms of macroeconomic issues, uh, was his demonstration that even if we target some particular macroeconomic variable, we can still have small investment uh, booms and financial bubbles. That is when we, for example, target the price inflation at 0%, we can still produce credit expansions that will result in more investments. And it is exactly the same thing with the Taylor rule. Even if we have assumed Taylor rule and we are targeting uh, the so-called output gap to be zero, that is to reach potential output, and even if we are targeting certain level of price inflation at the same time, we still will produce credit expansions that may result in financial bubbles and, and more investment booms. And that's the second part of the argument, which, is, which I find also very, very important, aside from the mainstream arguments against the Taylor Rule. Well, Matt, I appreciate your time today taking us through this. This is, a, as I say, this is a topic on which uh, so, so many free market economists go wrong to the point that a lot of people may just think, without knowing much about it, that the Taylor Rule must somehow be a free market uh, 
principle, but of course, the very nature in the very nature of it, it can't be. And then we see all even the practical problems, quite apart from the theoretical ones with it, and we see that it just needs to be chucked along with the Friedman constant rate of money growth rule. Instead of trying to come up with all these rules, what about just letting the free market that these people supposedly believe in handle this that's, question? You know, there you that's go. That's the thing. Well, the interest rate is just the price, right? It's a price, and the price is supposed to reflect conditions in the market. That's the thing. It's not supposed to reflect the balance between pri uh, general price inflation rate or the so-called output gap. The, the role and the function of the interest rate is to balance savings and investments in the financial market, and that's the key issue. So it's not supposed to be manipulated by the entity called the central bank in order to arrive at some macroeconomic goal of having inflation rate at uh, zero. Well, of course, it's always 2%, right? You know, stable prices are defined in the mainstream literature as 2% inflation, of course, right? To, to just leave, leave some margin for extra printing for the government. But in any case, uh, the interest rate is supposed to balance uh, the demand side and the supply side in the financial market, in the savings market, in the loan markets, and so forth. It's not supposed to satisfy our preferences for a particular macroeconomic variable to each region its assumed goal, right? It's, it's, it's a very, very different function, and that's the rule. I don't know why people are so, uh, are so sentimental about this uh, Taylor rule. Perhaps those uh, pro-market, mildly pro-market economists, well, they think in terms of uh, rules for the government, and somehow they think that if we have short and simple rules for government activities, then it somehow results in greater amount of uh, free market, but, but it's not really the case. I mean, you can write a simple rule saying government owns everything. It, 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 it doesn't mean that we are, we are closer to free market uh, when, when, we, when we advocate such rule, right? So uh, we have to always be careful about, about various rules that we invent for the government. It's not the question of having, having simple and clear rules. It's also the question of having rules that result in, in lower government power. That's, that's the thing. Well, Matt, thanks again for your work and for this conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, it was my pleasure. All right, everybody, tomorrow's a big day. Tomorrow's a big day for the show, and I'm going to tell you why in just a second. Just a quick reminder, if you have not checked it out yet, oh, my gosh, the Tom Woods bag of goodies is unbelievable over at supportinglisteners.com. For five smackers a month, you get transcripts of all the interviews, 60% off at libertyclassroom.com, a bunch of other discounts, the Kindle version of my forthcoming book, which is coming out October 14th, so you can expect that on that release date if you are a supporting listener. But also, if you, if you bump yourself up here to the $25 level, then you get the 90 video and audio files in my government course, which may as well be my anti-government course, the 180 audio and video files in my Western Civilization 1 course, a 31 lecture course, What's Wrong with Textbook Economics, the exclusive mini courses I've prepared just for you guys, plus a signed copy of one of my books, plus the transcripts, plus all that other stuff. It's unbelievable. Supportinglisteners.com, check that out. So what's tomorrow? What's the big deal about tomorrow? Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the show. One year. We made it through a year. It's amazing. And I've got like 250 episodes. It's unbelievable. What a great, exciting year it's been. I've gotten to talk to so many interesting people. You guys have given me excellent suggestions for people to talk to. I've had a lot of fun. I welcome your feedback, any suggestions, ways I can make the show better, people I can feature. By all means, let me know. Now, I can't always respond to all the email that I get, especially given the crushing workload I have for these Ron Paul homeschool courses that I'm doing. RonPaulHomeschool.com. Check that out, by the way. Look at all the reasons you should join that program, RonPaulHomeschool.com. You can get my courses at TomWoodsHomeschool.com if you want them apart from that program, but what a great program it is. It's worth checking out. But all the same, I read what you send me, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the different ways you've been supporting the show. I mean, in a way, I'm, you know, I'm kind of choked up a little bit. You know, a l little bit. Now, for the one-year anniversary, I could have a big guest and this and that, and that would make sense. But I think I'm just going to do the show on my own tomorrow, right? I mean, maybe, maybe that's a nice low-key way to celebrate the anniversary of the show. I'll be sitting here with my party hat on and my noisemakers and whatever, a big cake whatever okay so you guys do the same get your party hats out 
Get your cake for the one-year anniversary show. I, I guess I'm going to talk about, well, I'm gonna, ah, you know what? Who, who cares? I'm not going to tell you now. We'll, we'll figure out tomorrow what I'm going to talk about. But anyway, one year. How about that? I'm so excited. Make sure you are subscribing to the show on iTunes or Stitcher. You've got links to do that at TomWoodsRadio.com. And then the episodes automatically show up. At this stage of the game, I don't put all of them on YouTube. So if you've just been relying on YouTube, boy, you have missed out on a lot. So check us out over on iTunes. All right. I'm talking too much. i got to save some talking for tomorrow, the big anniversary program that you guys are going to be tuning in for. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.